The retropharyngeal space is that space in the body that no one worries about because it is simply a potential space that extends from the base of the skull to the chest until it becomes clinically relevant. Because the space extends from the base of the skull to the thorax, any infection entering the space has the potential to extend unimpeded to the thorax, resulting in endocarditis. Let's dissect the retropharyngeal space. Because the retropharyngeal space is a potential space, we need to zoom in to actually see its location. And here it is. When we zoom in on the image, the space is between the muscle layer forming the esophagus and the pharyngeal constrictors and the fascia lining the vertebrae. The objective of this dissection is to separate the skull of the occipital joint and flip the head forward so we can examine the pharynx from behind. The dissection can be quite cumbersome, but it will give us a view of the pharynx and access to subsequent dissections that are unforgettable. The first step of the dissection is to insert your fingers behind the carotid sheath into the retropharyngeal space. And do this from both sides of the cadaver to free up any adhesions that may exist as a result of the embalming. Next, the cadaver is put in the prone position and the posterior arch of the atlas is cut and removed. Realize that this is possible because previously we cut a wedge of the occipital bone to remove the brain. At this point, we use the scalpel to remove the remaining dura from the frame and magnum, which allows us to see the tectorial membrane, a continuation of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Deep to the tectorial membrane, Ligaments will affix the dens to the anterior arch of the atlas. These ligaments are generally difficult to dissect and identify in the cadaver. Nevertheless, they are present and must be cut to free the dens away from the atlas. Once this step is taken, it is possible to rotate the head freely. The next step requires you to insert a scalpel in between the atlas and the occipital condyles. The scalpel should insert relatively easily if you have the correct spot. After which, the anterior arch of the atlas can be forced free. The superior articular facet of the atlas is clearly visible in the image. The next step is to put the cadaver back in a supine position, then use the scalpel to cut the muscle attachments that will remain to the occipital bone. These include the prevertebral group, and these muscles must be cut on both sides. Here, the muscles are being cut on the right side, and now on the left side. Next, turn the cadaver on its prone position, then finish detaching all prevertebral muscles to the occipital bone, as indicated by the red line. The final step now is to simply apply pressure to the freed head and reflect it anteriorly, as indicated by the white arrows. Let's now take a look at the back of the pharynx and the retropharyngeal space and add labels to prominent structures. Once again, orient yourself with the image and note the occipital bone, dens, and body to the cervical vertebrae. Now look at the components of the neck that were reflected anteriorly. The muscular looking tissue represents the pharyngeal constrictors, the superior, middle, and inferior. They form the posterior wall of the pharynx. Just lateral to the constrictors, we can find the remnants of the carotid sheath that we observed when we looked at the neck from the front. Now we see the same structures, but from the posterior aspect. And recall what makes up the carotid sheath. From lateral to medial, we find the internal jugular vein, the vagus nerve, 
and the common carotid artery. Just behind the carotid sheath, we also find the sympathetic trunk. Remember the preganglionic fibers arose in the sympathetic fibers in the upper thorax, coalesce into a nerve, and travel into the neck to supply all sympathetic innervation to the head and neck. If you follow the sympathetic trunk superiorly, you get to the middle and superior cervical ganglia where the preganglionic fibers will synapse and then become postganglionic fibers. These will then piggyback onto the internal and external carotid arteries to continue to their final destinations in the head and neck. Expect variations in the appearance of the middle and superior cervical ganglia from cadaver to cadaver. Let's now move to the neck portion that was left behind after reflecting the head and neck. The vertebrae are aligned with prevertebral muscles, the muscles that were cut prior to reflecting the head. In reality, these muscles are still covered with the prevertebral fascia that contributed to one wall of the retropharyngeal space. The prevertebral muscles are the longus capitis and the longus coli. The capitis is lateral to the coli. Now, let's go back to the pharyngeal constrictors and remove the other wall of fascia of the retropharyngeal space to reveal the constrictors, and there are three. From superior to inferior, we call them the superior, middle, and inferior. The boundary between the middle and inferior is approximately indicated by the bulge observed in the slide that indicates the posterior horn of the hyoid bone. We will explore the division between the superior and middle constrictors in a second. Where the inferior constrictor narrows, it is considered a separate muscle, the cricopharynges. It represents the narrowest point of the complete alimentary canal. And just inferior to the cricopharynges muscle, we get to the esophagus. We now look for the intervening space between the superior and middle constrictors at the area indicated by the yellow arrow. We will look for a muscle and a nerve separating the two constrictors. Dissecting the area using scissor technique, we find the stylopharyngeus muscle, a muscle that helps raise the pharynx during the process of swallowing. It takes its origin from the styloid process. And the stylopharyngeus is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve 9. It is the only muscle that glossopharyngeal nerve innervates before turning inwards to reach the tonsillar bed and extend to the posterior one-third of the tongue. We now bring the carotid sheath back towards the midline, and the first thing we notice is that the internal carotid artery is quite tortuous. It should be running straight up to the carotid canal, yet look at its S-shaped curve. Next, Again, focus on the vagus nerve, which has been cleaned to its exit from the skull, the jugular foramen. If we follow the vagus nerve distally, we observe a relatively large branch emerging from it, the superior laryngeal nerve. Remember, this nerve gave rise to the internal laryngeal nerve, which becomes sensory about the vocal cords and a much more delicate nerve, the external laryngeal nerve, which is motor to one muscle, the cricothyroid. Going back to the jugular foramen, we identify the internal jugular vein exiting from it. Recall now the muscle that attaches just posterior to the ear, the sternocleidomastoid, and its nerve. The spinal accessory, cranial nerve 11. Recall that after innervating the sternocleidomastoid, the nerve continues in the posterior triangle to innervate the trapezius muscle. We now only have one last cranial nerve to identify in the region, and we look for it by moving the internal carotid artery more medially in the sternocleidomastoid muscle laterally.
to identify the hypoglossal nerve, cranial nerve 12, on its way to the hypoglossal foramen. We have now identified the relevant structures we should find in the retropharyngeal space. This now concludes this video presentation.